Meet Victor. Though he didn't get his name from his parents at birth or his adoptive parents, people first discovered him at the age of 9 or 10, completely wild, as if he'd spent his whole life among animals. I decided to start the video specifically with talking about Victor, because his story is the kind of story that raises questions. One day a wild boy was caught by people, but he didn't recognize them as his own kind. Victor ran back into the woods because he was used to another life. Despite all the efforts of the cleverest scientists of the time, and it was in the 18th and early 19th century he couldn't socialize, as if subconsciously all the time he wanted to hide from people. But why? Do all creatures just try to hide from us? Today, you'll learn why the essence of life in the wild is a game of hide and seek, how animals have influenced wars, and why some living things can only be seen from outer space. Let's go. Even if you live in a big city, you've probably still had to see a check of, let's say swifts at least once, little mice, Stray kittens? What about pigeons? Just think for a second. Are they ever small or are they like the orcs in Isengard, made as adults right away? <laughs> but it's one thing to miss a pigeon chick and quite another to miss a calf. Highland cows teach their babies to be stealthy right after birth by leaving them in the tall grass. The perfect camouflage developed over hundreds of years of fighting for life. The important thing is to not forget where you left the baby. Houdinis, you don't know where they're going to appear from or where they've been stashed. Ah, look. There they are. Cows hide their offspring, big cats blend into the surroundings, stonefish pretend they're rocks, zebras are just zebras. Both predators and their prey hide. But why? It's as if nature once decided it was going to have an endless game of hide and seek on our planet and got very into it. Because it's a game with a fatal outcome. If the victim loses, it gets eaten. If the predator loses, it may starve to death, refuse to breed, and eventually put its entire species in danger of extinction. And all that because of hide and seek, hide and seek for survival. The only animals that don't hide are those that aren't used to predators or someone so big that it doesn't make sense for them to hide in the bushes. You know, I can see you right. But every game has its champions even if it hides and seek inside the animal kingdom. We might have to choose who does better by comparing the skills of a mantis and some meerkat. But nature spared us the trouble and created greater mole rats. Have you ever met one? Well, that's not surprising because mole rats are the ninjas of animals, the best of the best at hide and seek. You can say that they resemble moles in some way they live underground, dig long systems of passages and push excessive soil to the surface forming mounds. But mole rats are larger, grayer and look more like a kumo robot only without the tail with teeth. These teeth help them dig tunnels and build real multi-level bunkers underground. And mole rats virtually don't have any natural enemies. They're so good at their underground life that even humans can't easily get rid of them. Try to find out where that furry thing crawled. It seems the only one who might find a mole rat is a badger burying a dead cow, and that's by accident. Well, first of all, the American badger isn't your average European cutie. One look at its face is enough to understand that it's some kind of monster made of 99% of Hayden, 1% of desire to devour everything it can get its paws on. At one time, people thought that badgers only ate small animals such as birds, frogs, or rodents, but they're actually omnivores, and the carcass of a dead cow looks very appetizing to them, so much that one badger's able to completely bury it in just a few days to set up some kind of a pantry, an underground refrigerator for storing food next to which these animals dig holes and live until they finish the cow. Now, imagine for a second if badgers behaved like squirrels, which always forget exactly where they hid their nuts. Squirrels definitely have a knack for hiding things, but sometimes, okay, sometimes they overdo it. Yes, those are acorns inside the antenna. Well, or some sort of squirrel hoard that scientists don't know anything about yet. Where are our nuts? We've been exposed, we've been exposed. As I said, while some animals were learning to hide themselves and their food, others were pumping up skills to find them. They evolved on purpose to gain an advantage over other species, for example, over humans. Snakes can boast of perfect eyesight because they rarely rely on it in really important moments, like hunting and finding a mate, but they can sense infrared radiation. For example, rattlesnakes have a pair of holes between their eyes and nostrils that they use as a thermal imager. With their help, 
it's possible for them to navigate even in total darkness, except when you're trying to find a buried cow. In that case, I don't think any thermal imager will help. People have already used snake vision to create their own devices, and this is hardly the first case of imitation of animals. It all started with camouflage. Today, it seems very normal that military uniforms have muted colors and help blend in with the surroundings. But until about the end of the 19th century, people didn't even think about that. Then technological progress and new methods of warfare required soldiers to be less conspicuous and the surrounding nature. And who knows about not being conspicuous better than wild animals? The first camouflage appeared about after animals' methods of camouflage were thoroughly studied and has continued to improve ever since. You can do more than just cover yourself in mud like Schwarzenegger. People have learned how to hide even large objects like ships and have been doing so since World War I. Instead of trying to hide the ship, they managed to confuse the enemy with stylish patterns on board but it was also important to calculate the ship's course, speed, and other indicators, so you knew where the torpedo should hit. But how can you calculate anything, especially manually, when there are strange spots in front of you which are also swaying on the waves? But no matter how hard we try, it's impossible to reach the level of animal camouflage. You can pretend to be a shrub by attaching branches to yourself as much as you want, but you'll never match those who have stealth in their blood. Mimicry is the ability to disguise yourself as other living creatures or the world around you so that no one will eat you or to the contrary to get closer to the prey and eat it. Even flowers mimic when they want to lure bees and bumblebees for pollination. And when you look at some creatures, you don't know what you're looking at. Is that moss? No, wait, it has a beak. Golden plovers are small birds that nest in the harsh northern regions and really know their camouflage. They blend in perfectly with the nature of the tundra they inhabit. They dissolve into textures. Alas, not everyone is as lucky as the plovers. Nature has its favorite children. And then there are, shall we say, ordinary ones. <laughs> They don't get the innate ability to camouflage and the ability to hide. And in such cases, there are only two choices, either extinction or come up with something on your own. And this crab of the Doric Frascon species came up with something. It caught a sea urchin. Okay, actually not just caught, they have a symbiotic relationship, something like Venom and Eddie Brock. We are Venom. The crab gets protection from the sea urchin, and the urchin gets food, plus the ability to move from place to place and, well, get even more food. No, we're not going to bite the head off this fish. But why? I'll give you a few seconds to imagine Tom Hardy as a crab. Yes. Now look, here's a really unique example of mimicry that happened literally before our eyes. For thousands of years, the flower Fritillaria de la Vie grew peacefully on the rocky slopes of the Chinese mountains and felt quite comfortable until people intervened in its life. They were harvesting the flower to use in traditional medicine, and Frillaria de la Vie wasn't delighted. As commercial harvesting intensified, the plant disappeared. Well, not quite. It quickly evolved learning to produce gray and brown leaves and flowers not easily seen by pickers. The color of the leaves now matched the color of the rocks where the Fritillaria de la Vie grows. But this only happened in areas where people were particularly active in collecting. Honestly, I think this example is one of the coolest illustrations of how nature adapts to human activity. What else can it do really? And here one would think, hey, people aren't stupid enough to confuse a flower with a rock. All these methods of disguise, mimicry, and living underground can only fool other animals. But not us. We are the pinnacle of evolution. Yeah, that's why the smartest scientists were once fooled by their tragulies. These are creatures that look like the love child of a deer and the house cat. Very strange and very cute at the same time. The last time researchers saw tragulies was in 1990 and then the animals just disappeared. Were they exterminated? Were they extinct due to environmental influences? What happened? As it turns out, nothing. The tragulies just hid so well that no one could find them for 30 years. It would seem that people should have just put a couple of dozen cameras in the woods and the tragulies would come back from the dead. But not all animals can be seen that easily. To look at phytoplankton, that is plankton capable of photosynthesis, you have to take a microscope. All these microalgae consume carbon and produce in return oxygen. Or get aboard the ISS. 
It seems strange, but you can see the tiniest organisms from a huge height because there really are many of them. So many that phytoplankton form huge patches in the ocean. So gigantic that it is visible from space. A blooming, an explosion of life. Now that you've realized how many hidden creatures there are around, take a deep breath and realize this. They're not just around, they're right in your face, right now. Demodex are a genus of parasitic mites that live inside or near hair follicles. They are considered one of the smallest arthropods. They have eight tiny legs and whoa, whoa, don't rush to wash your face. It won't help anyway. Even soap, even antiseptic, because it's simply impossible to get rid of Demodex. They are transmitted to humans in early childhood from contact with parents and live quietly, feeding on skin fat. It's a natural part of your facial ecosystem. Well, at least now, you'll never feel alone again. See you later.